Great, you guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll get going. We don't want to delay uh, uh, Harry from dinner or too long or whatever, whatever the case may be. So um, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, a long uh, friend of ours that has really been very generous with his time over the years. And we're gonna have a conversation. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation tonight about uh, New Orleans and about management and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, so first I'll introduce our friend, Harry Shearer. I first, when did I first encounter it? Actually the funniest thing, one of the funniest things I've ever heard in my life is this skit I watched as a kid on Saturday Night Live about ma male um, synchronized swimming. <laughs> and I um, almost messed myself the first time I, I watched that. So you guys should just you should Google that. But but I, I really first um, uh, sort of came to um, appreciate the this gentleman's talent um, when I was an undergrad, like many of you, in a lab at UCSB in 19, I don't know, 89, 1990, working on Sundays in, in my lab. Um, and uh, Joe Frank would come on the radio on the station. And then after Joe Frank, uh, Le Sh Harry's sh show called Le Show um, would come on and it's fantastic. So it's something I listen to every week. Um, uh, now, mostly from a podcast because our um, local radio people are silly here, but um, it's fantastic. I really encourage you all to check Thanks. it out. It's it's a wonderful, it, it's it's news, it's satire, it's it's, it's humor um, and it's a, it's a dose of reality and sanity sometimes in our world that seems a little crazy. Um, and then and then as we started and then um, in 2005 as we'll as we'll talk about in a second, when um, you know uh, we were moving down here from the Bay Area to start this university and we had you know the the craziness of uh, Hurricane Katrina hit and we start, I started taking you all there in our service learning classes. Um, uh, Harry's been very generous in many years, has, has taken time to meet with us at Parkway Bakery or, or at uh, Historic New Orleans Collection or whatever and give his perspective. Um, and so it, it, we very much appreciate all the time he's donated uh, to us uh, over, over the years, taking time out of his busy day. So, um, so we're really appreciative. So having said that, this is the great uh, Harry Shearer. Oh. And, um, and he's here today, though, because he's also a fan. Yeah, everybody clap. That's good. Everybody should, should clap. Um, but he's here today because... Um, while he's a Southern California guy, and you correct me if I'm saying something wrong, dude. So he's a Southern California boy, but he and his family have sort of transplanted to New Orleans for much of the year, a few decades ago. And so he's really a, a true a citizen of New Orleans, and that's how he says it, because he's, he's now from there. Uh, and um, that's where and, I vote. And that's where you vote. So that's, that's all super important. And, and, and <laughs> And the context of that, when Katrina hit, he had a unique perspective. He had a unique perspective of, of someone from the inside and seeing it. And he also had a national platform with this show. And he began just speaking what he was seeing and the truth to power. And that led to all, a whole bunch of things. If you've not seen um, The Big Uneasy, um, I would I, I sent a link out with the invite for folks, but um, I strongly encourage you to watch it. Um, it's a great critique, and we're going to talk about that stuff. And so, uh, without further ado, that's my way too long introduction uh, to our friend Harry. Good Shea. night, everybody. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. That's it. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'll see you next week. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, with that, let, let's just start with um, maybe a brief introduction, since uh, I was. In my class today, I was talking about the Santa Barbara oil spill. My students are too young. They don't remember the Santa Barbara oil spill. And then I was talking about the Deepwater Horizon. They kind of remembered the Deepwater Horizon a little bit. And so, so you know, 20, 19 years ago is, is a bit uh, back in time. So, so why don't you uh, give us the, your take on the intro of the start of the, the storm and the craziness? Well, um, New Orleans is a, in a hurricane-prone area. It's experienced a lot of storms throughout the years. It's um, mainly survived them. Um, in 25 years before 2005, I'm not good at math, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> there was a storm that, in the terms of the day, ravaged New Orleans, did about 20% worth of housing damage. The then president, Lyndon Johnson, came down to New Orleans the next day. He didn't fly over it. He actually landed, unlike George W. Bush years later. And he swore that there would be a protective system built that would protect <clears throat> New Orleans from any future storm. And it went to Congress, and they uh, passed a law 
calling for a system to be built that would protect New Orleans against the maximum probable hurricane. And they hired the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the only choice they could make, uh, to do the job of building a hurricane protection system. And the first thing the Corps did is redefine the job as protecting against a standard project hurricane, their words, which was much less fierce than the maximum um, probable hurricane. So they underdefined their job to start with, and then they underperformed on that underdefined job. Um, there was a case in uh, the 1990s. They, it took 40 years, and they were never fin really finished with this system. Um, but in the 1990s, a contractor was working on these flood walls, and the flood walls had to be anchored by a steel plate that went down into the ground. And the contractor came to the Army Corps and said, we've dug down 19 feet for this steel plate, and we're still not hitting solid ground. We're still hitting mushy, swampy earth. Uh, we need to dig deeper. And the Corps said, no, the contract calls for 19 feet. That's what you're going to do. Took them to court, sued them to make the contractor stop digging. And of course, that was one of the parts of the flood wall that collapsed uh, under the uh, wake of the storm surge. The story started in terms of discovering what really happened in Katrina a day after the storm passed by to the northeast of New Orleans. It did not hit the city. Dodge it, a bullet. Dodge a bullet. Dodge a bullet. That Monday, Monday, August 29th, the uh, news in New Orleans was we dodged a bullet, except for the Lower, East, uh, lower Ninth Ward, uh, which got uh, hit with 18 feet, a wall of water, which cut off all communications. So the rest of the city had no idea that this part of the city was being brutally destroyed. But after all this happens, the head of, then head of the then U, uh, LSU Hurricane Center came down to look at the damage, saw these flood walls, which had toppled, and the Corps of Engineers was saying that they were overtopped, that the water was so high that it overtopped these walls and toppled them from above. And what he found was a high water mark halfway up the walls which told you right away they couldn't have been overtopped. They were undermined from the bottom. And that led to an engineering forensic investigation by two universities, one of which concluded that this was, in their words, the greatest man-made engineering catastrophe since Chernobyl. Um, it was depicted otherwise in the national media, um, big natural disaster. Um, the, one of the professors at Berkeley who dealt with this investigation said, there really are not a lot of natural disasters. They're usually the result of something done wrong by man. Um, <clears throat> and sure enough, I was interviewing all these people involved, including whistleblower from inside the Corps of Engineers for my radio show. And in October of 2006, sorry, five, six, no, sorry. Nine, um, Obama came to New Orleans for his first visit as president and said, I'm here at the scene of this great natural disaster. And I realized either he knows, which is bad, or he doesn't know, <laughs> which is bad. So I made this documentary film to sort of spread the word. The uh, <clears throat> I was, I grew up as a, among other things, a journalist. I was uh, friends with a lot of journalists. I had a great deal of faith in the journalistic profession, which was pretty much shattered when I found that the national media, even with the face of this, even in the face of this information that my documentary had provided, came back down on the fifth anniversary and didn't change their initial reporting, which was, City below sea level, it is not, it is half above sea level. Only black people uh, on roofs for five days. With Poor no people, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, 
there was an entire county full of white people, St. Uh, St. Bernard Parish, uh, on their positive St. Bernard, a positive St. Bernard. <laughs> yeah. But one reason why the national media didn't ever put them on television was because St. Bernard Parish isn't near a freeway off ramp and they didn't know the geography otherwise. So sometimes the decisions of what to cover are as simple as, is there a freeway off ramp? Um, Completely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in, in, in that in that particular contrast, and so St. Bernard is just sort of farther out from the lower ninth, basically. And that was, I mean, you know, you always hear, I didn't grow up near train tracks and they always hear, oh, the other side of the tracks, that was that's literally the other side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. So after the damage happened and everybody was nuked, the wealthier, whiter side, literally side of the tracks, people, FEMA trailers starting to, you know, you know, again, everybody's damaged and hurt and harmed, but but some people were come back very quick. And on the other side of the train tracks, essentially nothing or, or virtually like whole blocks without seeing yeah. Yeah. Um, recovery. So absolutely that component. So I, I think one thing that that is interesting in this stuff is, um, and maybe is is maybe a little hard for some of our students. Well, there's many things that are hard to uh, uh, fully comprehend, but I would say keeping on the things you're talking about so far. Is you know when I was younger, um, I would think, oh, the 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 institution, the thing, the university, the the county, the whatever it is, they're they're like competent and they're they're rocking and rolling, and they're gonna fix it. And oh my God, there's this bad thing, and I'm not sure why the bad thing happened, but they're gonna fix it. And um, and in the in the case of the Katrina story, there's so many points, like there's so many decision points where we could have fixed it or we could have taken a different path. And we seem to, unfortunately, way too often have taken the, will be the- Yes, yes. And the, and the decision points came both from the outside, from outside observers, outside engineers who said, hold up, you guys, you're not digging deep enough. You're not doing this sort of protection. And from the inside, uh, so that uh, without going into specific detail, the Corps was building stuff that they already knew from their own people inside was not sufficient to the job at hand, which had already been underdefined to start with by them. In any case, that happened. Congress gave them $14 billion and said, try again, maybe don't screw it up as bad this time. And the Corps built a new system, <laughs> which they were bragging about uh, on national television. They no longer call it a hurricane protection system. It has now been rechristened a hurricane risk reduction system. So don't look for us for protection. We'll just reduce your risks. Um, and there's a, one of the points that was made to me very forcefully by an architect in New Orleans who follows what the Dutch do with water. Mm -hmm. um, and parenthetically, the Dutch came to New Orleans in 1953 when they had horrible flooding and looked at the internal pumping system that the city had, uh, which was a, at that point some 90 years old, because it was the best example of a city being able to pump out lots of rainwater. So now the Dutch have devised a whole new way of what they call living with water, as opposed mm -hmm. to what the Corps of Engineers does, which is fighting a war against water yep incidentally in case you don't know the ending water always wins <laughs> um and so he was pointing out uh the problems with the new system and um one of them is that the core is focused and uh, to a point of lack of any other intention in making big, strong, unmoving objects. Very manly, they're very manly. Very manly. And so they're building static objects in a dynamic world. And this is their ba major conceptual mistake. So they built some more big objects, flood walls and other kinds of walls and gates. Um, and the new system 
survive. You may recall just a couple of weeks ago, Hurricane Francine. Yeah, so 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 I don't I I know the the storm hit, but I didn't get a whole lot of details. So what have you heard about how how it struck and how it played out? Well, it did a lot of rain damage, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the city is easily flooded. And the city has this great system of, as the core likes to say, dewatering. <laughs> um, but this was almost the opposite of the Katrina story. In the Katrina story. The city pumps worked, sending the water out to the flood wall canals, and the Corps system didn't work. In this case of Francine, the Corps system survived. I wouldn't say it worked, but it survived. Manly. Survived yeah. manly. And the city had been underfunding the sewage and water board, which runs the local pumps, the civic pumps that pump the rainwater out. A lot. Um, one of the curiosities of that system is that it runs on a now totally um, outdated form of electricity, 25 watt electricity. So any power source has to be transformed into this archaic form of electricity before it can be used to power the pumps. And some of those power stations failed and some of those pumps failed. So the city flooded more than it should have. Perfect. I, so a couple thing, a couple things there. So one, the the bad design. And so one thing for all you guys watching this, when we talk about GIS datums and all these kinds of things and measurements, that's not that's not baloney. That really, really matters. In the case of New Orleans, building a levee, you know, when you think it's whatever, 15 feet high, but it ends up only really being 13 feet high or above sea level, whatever, that has direct consequences. So the details matter. Harry has a, a degree in history, so he knows that details matter. Um, and then another one is about this is when we see some, so we were, to, so we were just mentioning there about how paths forward, should we make it a rigid structure or small and we can debate that, but it's also really important when we do make mistakes to call them out and to not say people are pure evil necessarily, but, but to, but to really call them out. And one of the things in the wake of New Orleans is there seemed to have generally been a, a, a hesitancy amongst many quarters to call out the core and and some of these other uh, actors as not doing their job or not well i mean properly. i think you may have noticed this about humanity when <laughs> humanity screws up and there are no negative consequences for that behavior it will continue yeah that's really what happened uh, at the time of katrina absolutely and so i think i think and we're, and but and and then before we get so we'll we'll turn and start seeing if you guys have some questions in in a minute but to sort of transition maybe a little bit um you know i hope you guys all come with us to new orleans we're still hunting for money we're trying to find funding for this year but we hope you guys come with with us uh, on on one of our next service learning trips um but but you can see this stuff there it, it it's it's hard to explain until you see the one of the flood one of the one of the um uh, uh walls along the canals that is you know x height is like say three feet above that just stops and does not connect to the pump house because people thought oh that would be bad if we connected all the way to the pump like like decisions that you're like how did this how did this pass muster but 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 this is not a story of of our friends in louisiana it is but it's also a story of the u.s so that same entity that that certifies the the, the anti-flooding or the protectionness or the risk reduction or whatever the the euphemism we're working is the same entity that's certifying our levees in the san francisco bay delta that's that are supplying about a third ish of our water to ventura county for example same entity that that has certified the dams the ringe dam and matillaha dam and and all that kind of stuff so this the same structure isn't isn't only contained in the city of New Orleans or, or, or contained no, in the no. state of Louisiana. There's a wonderful book called Paving Paradise, written by two Florida journalists, and it discusses how the Corps almost destroyed the Everglades in Florida. Yep. And again, when Congress was deciding, well, let's fix it, they gave the Corps seven billion dollars uh, and said, try to fix this, and one of the great stories of that attempt was the Clean Water Act, which was passed in the early 70s, required that any water uh, construction be done in the future. 
resulted in would result in no net loss of wetlands. And 30 years after the Corps was put in charge of enforcing the Clean Water Act in Florida, there was an amazingly large loss of wetlands because any developer that wanted to build on a, a wetland, the Corps would say, well, okay, just as long as you build a compensating piece of wetlands over here, ignoring the fact that one of the things humans don't know how to do is build a wetlands. <laughs> so there, there was, you know, it's it's a very complicated system, um, how how wetlands works. It's true. So uh, they do they do bad stuff wherever <laughs> wherever they go. Um, and as I say, there was no negative. Con- no, nobody lost as much as a parking place, right? For what happened in New Orleans. So of course you'll get. Now the the problem that exists in the new system. I'll just go into this for a second. There are these three what they're called outfall canals mm-hmm. that take the rainwater drained from the city and push it into the adjoining Lake Pontchartrain, where water is welcome and you know. Deserve. <laughs> and what the Corps decided in building this new protection system is water from Lake Pontchartrain had come into those canals during Katrina and had pushed those flood walls of those canals over. We're not going to challenge those flood walls this time because we're going to put gates between the canals and the lake. So they never fixed those flood walls because they weren't going to be challenged again. Well, what challenges them is if there's heavy rain during a hurricane because the gates are down, so the water can't escape the canals. Fills up, fills up. Big, big buildup of rainwater. Those flood walls have not been fixed. There was an incident in 2012 when an engineer friend of mine foiled the internal conversations of the Corps at the time of a hurricane. And it was, to use the term of art at the time, hair on fire. (laughs) So that is the new danger, that if it rains hard during a hurricane and the canals now have been redefined to have a much lower safe water level, if that has succeeded, we'll get another disaster. And we all know that the the challenges are only getting worse. So uh, Palos Verdes is slipping into the ocean. Mm-hmm. It's, not, it's not taking a, a certain golf course fast enough, but, <laughs> but, it's, but it's taking stuff out, right? And yeah. so these things are only becoming more challenging. And we can stick our head in the sand and, and just hope that our hair is on fire, but we don't tell anybody. Uh, or or we can um, you know try to be more adult about it or more realistic about these issues. I think it's also important to say before I open up for questions is that um, this is, New Orleans is not, we might be portraying this area as sort of a basket case or horrible. It's a fantastic place. You guys should come with us. It, it's a wonderful place. It's completely worth saving. It's not worth writing off. N- none of our areas are worth writing off, but no. um, But it's, it's um, we need to do better. I think. I'm there because I fell in love. My wife and I both fell in love with it. It is an amazing place. It's not like any place else in the United States. And to show you one little example of sometimes there is justice, the uh, at the time of Katrina, the then Speaker of the House, Denny Hastert, uh, said, well, why don't they just pick up and move it to somewhere north? Ignoring the fact that love of place is a huge part of life in New Orleans. It is 300 years old. Every building has been through a lot. Every building has a a set of stories to tell. But he said, why don't they just pick it up and move it? Denny Hastert is now serving a long jail sentence for abusing young male wrestlers that he was a coach of before he got to Congress. Sometimes there's justice. Sometimes there's justice. Don't count on it. (laughs) <laughs> all right awesome well with that why don't uh, i'm happy to uh, for folks that have their own questions and w- are wondering about stuff or don't understand maybe some of the things we're talking about or want more detail or anything uh feel free to unmute and go ahead and, and ask your question i have a question hey willow yeah go for it <laughs> hi uh drew it's nice to meet you my name is willow jackson and i'm in uh dr anderson's coastal management class um 
I do have a question. Um, in your opinion, what improvements could have been made in preparedness prior to Hurricane Katrina? Well, there are, as I said, there are these two reports from two different universities, UC Berkeley and LSU. And they went into some detail in terms of what memos went upstairs. Mm -hmm. They we need to dig this deeper. We need to make this stronger. So there's a whole range. I'm not an engineer, but I'm aware of a whole range of reports that were telling the Corps, we need to do better in this way. We need to build this stronger. We need to dig this deeper. And they ignored them. Why they ignored them? Um, there have never been hearings where they were under oath. So... We don't really know the answer to that question. Um, my cynicism uh, has gotten to a point when I think there's one answer to every question about what happens in America. Uh, it's my <laughs> mula, mula, mula. Mula, mula, mula. So, you know, either they didn't have the money in their budget or they had internal people who thought, nah, we don't need that, we're good. Um, so institutional pride becomes a factor. Um, stubbornness, human stubbornness becomes a factor. So there were, there were, to answer your question, things that could have been done better. Um, digging deeper, building stronger, uh, using better materials, all these things uh, factored into it. Um, and continue to. Okay. I'll add, I'll add one more uh, dimension to it, um, which is, uh, you know, back in the day, the Army Corps was full of engineers, was was full of technical proficient, uh, you know, experts that knew how much force uh, whatever could carry and all that kind of jazz. That era um, has, by the time Katrina hits, that that era has, for the most part, ended. And so mm -hmm. the, the Army Corps kind of has two sort of roles now. One is sort of uh, regulatory checking for wetlands and sort of enforcement kind of stuff. But the other arm, the arm that used to do construction, no longer does construction. And very clearly, one of the reasons why one of our friends got canned from the um, hurricane center that existed at LSU was he was speaking to some of these issues. And it turns out that now the Army Corps of Engineers is a big funder of consulting firms and and contractors. And so they flow a lot of money out. And so now the folks that work inside the Army Corps uh, of that division, not not the sort of wetland and you know inspection division, but but the the construction of folks, they basically oversee grant distributions and money going out. And they don't they, they're not I wouldn't say there's no engineers there, but 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 the the old experts you know technical cadre of all these people that knew stuff they're not there. Long so gone. It's harder to Long see gone. We're, we're all this idea of everything needs to be private sector everything needs to be shoved out everything like the government can't do anything when you say that for decades and decades people start to believe it and they start to act that way and and you know while there's some great benefits to to private sector and and and, and that kind of stuff you probably should have a technical expert in your organization that's in charge of doing technical things, I would. Dr. Dr. Bob B. from UC Berkeley describes the agency now as the U.S. Army Corps of Contract Administrators. Um, and um, Michael Grunwald, a journalist who studied the Army Corps, wrote a great series of pieces in the Washington Post about 20 years ago. Um, the only pieces of, of great detail yet to be written about the Army Corps, um, define this as the uh, Iron Triangle. The Army Corps gives money to contractors. The contractors give money to local elected officials so that they'll stay in office and keep funding the Army Corps. And so there's this triangle of funding that sort of makes all the participants impervious to any outside input. It's powerful. It's a powerful, yeah, uh, uh, self-reinforcing, um, yeah, thing. I'd mm -hmm. say. Um, uh, and I would just say that one of the reasons our friend was let go, one of the reasons that, that Louisiana State University in the state of Louisiana, where hurricanes smack it all the time, got rid of their hurricane center, is 
is because they wanted to get rid of our friend and they yep. had to sort of justify yep. dissolving. Now I, now I have to say, um, and this is not in defense of anybody except Mother Nature, <laughs> um, that at the time of Katrina, the media and the information sphere was rife with predictions that there would be a plenitude of more and stronger hurricanes coming to the Gulf. That hasn't happened. Uh, we have been so fortunate that the, the, the bad luck has been foisted on other people. Hurricanes in the last 20 years have mainly, not totally, there have been some in the Gulf, but mainly gone up the Atlantic coast and not gotten into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so the core has been fortunate in that their system has not been challenged the way it was before, but it will be. Yeah, totally. Uh, anybody else uh, unmute and go ahead and, and ask a question if you guys have any questions. I apologize, Harry. I actually- No, 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 okay. no if, you, if you want to go again, we'll go ahead and ask have one more question. Um, what key lessons in terms of coastal management and disaster recovery did you take away from your experience with Hurricane Katrina? Well, <clears throat> coastal management in uh, Louisiana is a very complex problem. Um, the entire the Gulf Coast was built by the Mississippi River depositing uh, sediment uh, along the coastline, along its banks, basically. And over some thousands of years, the Louisiana coast was built by increasing increments of sediment. Um, in 1927, there was a huge Mississippi River flood. John Barry wrote a great book about it. It's still worth reading. And the response to the Mississippi River flood was to levy the river to put levees to prevent the river from overflowing its banks. Well, the overflowing of its banks was what distributed that sediment. So that sediment has not been distributed for nearly a century now. That has resulted in the erosion of the coastline because <clears throat> ocean waters and storm surge come in to these coastal areas there is no compensating sediment distribution by the river. And so the, the result is the, the ocean and the uh, storm surge winds. So the state of Louisiana has uh, embarked on a system of rebuilding that land, uh, re basically imitating what the river would have done, but doing it in a much shorter time frame, um, And that has resulted in difficulties of its own because over this time, fishermen, um, oystermen have built businesses and lives over these creatures being at a certain point in this system, a certain point of this decreasing landmass. If there's more water and more sediment going to be distributed a la the river, they're going to have to move. And so there's been political opposition to parts of this plan, which teaches us that moneyed interests can develop around any particular arrangement, geographical or political, and that when it is threatened, even for good reason or good cause, it will react negatively and lobby against it. So the main takeaway I get from the experience of, of Louisiana coastal salvation is <clears throat> you have to be very careful to take care of those moneyed interests lest they engineer a stop to the salvation of the coastline. Uh, you have to find a way to compensate them, help them move, do whatever you can, but that has to be incorporated into the coastal restoration process. It can't be an afterthought. Yeah, that's good. I like that. I was wondering if Willa wants to share a little bit about where you're from and how this might intersect with what you've experienced in your community. Where I live or where I- Oh, I'm sorry, Willa, where, 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 where Willa, Willa is from. Her, her Alaska. 
roots. Willow's yeah. from Alaska. Oh, I'm actually here right now. Kind of. Oh true. my gosh. <laughs> There's nature, a bunch of yeah. trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm from a small island called Cake, Alaska. Um, it's very, very, very small. Um, and there we're super reliant on the ocean for not only our way of life, but for food and uh, income as well. Mm -hmm. And with climate change, like I've seen a really big decline in the amount of subsistence foods that we've been able to get from the ocean. Um, and that's kind of what influenced me to become environmental science, just because I noticed how big of a change it was making in my community. So I'm really focused on how I could improve that um not only in my coastal community but other coastal indigenous communities that are facing food insecurity due to um lack of subsistence foods coming from the ocean um so yeah that's why i'm kind of not kind of but definitely interested in yeah well that's a big deal in the pacific northwest generally partly because of the building of hydroelectric dams that mm -hmm. have prevented salmon from spawning upriver the way they used to. And you have all these indigenous um, groups in Oregon and Washington that are going, where Where are the freaking salmon now? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's been pretty bad. I know in 2019, I went to a protest for the pebble mine because the pebble mine would have definitely uh, influenced the salmon runs um, mm. in Alaska. And that was like a really, really big thing. And we kind of had a fight uh, the university that I was kind of a part of at the time to even do it because it was like this whole like political thing but we ended up doing it anyway <laughs> so mm. yeah I was a part of this group called the Rural um, Alaskan Honors Institute and it was like a summer program up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and mm. uh, a bunch of indigenous students were also kind of going through the same thing so it was a really powerful thing just to kind of fight against it but it's definitely something that we run into a lot here is the hydroelectric dams and just dams in general so. yeah well i mean it's 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 all a part of a a greater story that mm -hmm. i don't think we focus on enough which is when we as humans um set about to build large structures of any kind or large systems of any kind uh, we're very bad at predicting negative consequences. We hear mm -hmm. all the hype. We hear all the great things that are going to happen if we build these dams or great things happen if we, if we build in the case. Autonomous cars are going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Mr. Go, a, a, a canal that was built by the Army Corps as an alternative to the Mississippi River because the Mississippi River curves and this was a straight line. Um, mm -hmm. People were saying at the time, you are just building a way for storm surge to come straight up this canal and hit the uh, city, and um, they ignored that, and they were they were right. That's exactly what happened. So, you know, but negative predictions are so often derided as "oh, you pessimists," yeah. and you yeah. well, usually they're naysayers. Right. Usually mm -hmm. naysayers. Usually they're right. Yes. Yes, for sure. It's kind of uh, sad. I wish people would kind of just go on the route of it's better to be safe than sorry. But um, no. And, you know, it's just a happy coincidence. I'm being ironic that the uh, usual alignment is that the people who want to build this stuff are the people with money and the people who are fighting it are the people without money. What? Yep. Really? what yeah go figure that's crazy so i'd say there's various ways to respond to that right one is like you were saying willa to sort of actively engage and 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 bring your voice to the to the um public uh, uh debates and stuff the yeah. other is to, i think i think remaining i think humor is an incredibly important and powerful thing like not to get too down in the dumps it's very easy for us to get caught in the negative stuff and and only see the negative predictions and that kind of stuff but but i think you know we all have to find our path to to not be disempowered our path to to figure out the way to sort of go back to that well and get that energy because these things these fights are worth fighting and they're it's great and well and you know I'm, uh, uh, new orleans offers a great example um They've been building houses in New Orleans for 300 years, as I said. 
And they built them with the awareness that the place is prone to flooding and prone to rainfall and prone to storms. So they built them with certain protections. So they were elevated uh, above ground, um, among other things. And they, because there was no air conditioning at the time, they had window arrangements that allowed air to blow through uh, in the summertime. And after World War II, there was a um, hubris that said, we don't need that stuff anymore. We're, we're modern Americans. We know how to build stuff. So they started building suburban style houses that were on slabs instead of being raised. And those were among the hundreds of thousands of houses that were most easily damaged when the floodwaters raged. So the old people, the people who had been there all that time, knew how to build that stuff, including indigenous people. They were right. And we, you know, moderns, oh, we're so smart. We know how to do things now. We're wrong. Perfect. Uh, and somebody else, uh, Gabriel or Victor, anybody else wanted to ask a question or? Or no, okay. All right, so then- I'm so still I'll, thinking I'll, of my question right now. Oh, you're still thinking of your question, yeah. okay, good. Uh, while you're thinking, I guess I would say um, another another theme that maybe we saw in in Katrina or in the wake of Katrina, and um, maybe we're seeing a lot more of that now, is this idea of, of disinformation, misinformation, um, statements that are not uh, wholly correct, shall we say, if not outright propaganda and stuff. And so we, we, we saw that in a bunch of ways. And, and I'll just say one example um, that, again, for you all that are coming to this from afar, from the first time, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to discern. But for example, what, as, going back to one of the things that Harry mentioned, and maybe he can talk about this a little more, is that, you know, um, oh my God, Hurricane Katrina became a category five, which is the strongest of our ca categories based on wind. Uh, when it's out in the middle of the of the um, Gulf. Uh, Gulf of Mexico, right? <laughs> then it starts to weaken. It starts to weaken. So by the time it makes landfall, it's a category three. By the time it gets to the city of New Orleans, it's a category one. And if you recall, Harry said that they were designing for a strong storm. What you heard from folks is saying is they were trying to rewrite the narrative. And what they said was, oh, we didn't design for a hurricane five storm. It was not our fault. It was like, you know, this, this was, this superseded our design standards. And again, if you're not paying attention to the details, that's a, maybe, maybe a subtle thing. It's, it was used as a get out of jail free card, right? Mm -hmm. It was used as not our fault. And so, so that, that's a, that's a, that's one small example. Another one was that our president at the time said things like nobody, well, I can't do the voice, Harry can do the voice, but like nobody can, nobody, um, Nobody thought that the levees wouldn't work, except for everybody I knew. <laughs> yeah, I was worried well, about that. So, can you talk a little bit about misinformation, Harry, and, and propaganda, and and yeah, you know, that kind of uh, side of stuff? This is a very sore point with me because um, one of the things I did as a kid was I I was the ed uh, an editor at my school paper, and I was a journalist for several years after that, wrote freelance for a bunch of publications, including the LA and New York Times and stuff. And I was friends with journalists and I liked them and they were funny and interesting people. And I trusted them and I thought they were generally good folks. And when I got to this story, they had come down to New Orleans. As I mentioned before, they had no idea of the geography of the place. So some of their coverage was limited by their unwillingness to take anything but a freeway. Um, but they were incredibly stubborn. One of the reasons I got involved in this was we in New Orleans were getting incredibly detailed and accurate information from our local newspaper, which went from a disposable rag to an indispensable informer. And it was that information was not getting out to the rest of the country. And as I say, when the journalists came down five years later, they weren't interested in the new information. They weren't interested in what has been learned since then. They were patting themselves on the back for we wagged our finger, but Anderson Cooper wagged his finger in the face of Senator Mary Landrieu. He spoke truth to power. No, he didn't. She wasn't powerful and he wasn't speaking truth. <laughs> Aside from that, uh, Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, so, and, and it was summed up 
deliciously for me by a guy named Sam Stein, who at the time was in LA. So I was talking to him and trying to get him interested in the story and I'm giving him some of the details that I've given you all today. And uh, his response was, we don't want to get into the weeds. Literally those words, we don't want to get into the weeds, meaning we don't want to get into the details of a story and digest it so that you in the audience can comprehend it. Well, pardon me, that's your friggin' job. Yeah. So there's a mental laziness afoot, which um, I think co coexists with a wholesale depopulation of the journalism industry over the last 20 years. So that I love to tell this story. A friend of mine, David Gregory, was hosting Meet the Press a few years ago. And he opened his broadcast one Sunday by saying, good morning. We have a breaking news story occurring right now in Pakistan. And for the latest, we go to NBC News chief correspondent Richard Engel reporting today from London. Like you can see Pakistan from London. And by the way, the, only, feeling good. Yeah, feeling good. And the only word that he, he, he misspoke was chief foreign correspondent. He was at the time the only foreign correspondent. That's why they had to go to London for the report. So partly it's been starvation of these institutions. They're like yeah. Potemkin totally. institutions. The front looks the same. The anchor at the desk looks the same. The front page looks serious. And then behind them, there's nothing. Um, that's accidental disinformation or misinformation. Um, the guy that I cited saying we don't want to get in the weeds, that's deliberate lack of information. And then of course, there's this very powerful machine spewing lies. That's actual disinformation um, being abetted sometimes right now, it's supposedly uh, at a great extent, to a great extent by foreign countries, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Um, it's unfortunately up to us as consumers of news to not just rely on one source, to double check what we're reading here by reading something else there, to you know, look at a right-wing publication, look at a left-wing publication, look at a supposedly neutral public, you know, to do all that work. It is work and they used to do it for us they're not doing it now. And if you don't want to be misinformed, it's the work that we all as citizens have to do. Yeah. And then that's one of the reasons why I have you guys do your weekly news posts, right? Is one so that we can, you know, hear the topics that are coming, but it's also to try to, you know, really encourage you guys to get back in the habit or start the habit of frequently checking in on news sources. And, and um, it's very, I, I totally get it, how, how easy it is to not do that on your social media and just sort of get your curated feeds. And I, I get the, the attraction of that. Um, but as, as the informed people, as you guys graduate and go into these other realms and, and jobs and stuff, you need to be the one who's the person that, you know, if you see some baloney, you need to say that, nah, that's not really right. And, and if you're not staying abreast of the info, you're going to be, you're, you're very easy to be manipulated. You're going to think that salami instead. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Anybody else, anybody else have a, a question you guys are wondering about or something uh, you're, you're, you're musing on. No? Uh, I do have one question mm -hmm. which is um, when it comes to like having a dialogue about like climate change or other environmental issues that have been made like contentious for reasons that they shouldn't be um, like w when you're talking with someone who has like very different viewpoints from your own how do you how do you like maintain like a conversation that they'll be willing to listen to without like stepping on any landmines, I guess, like what's your go-to <laughs> strategy? That's a great question. And it's like, I think a dominant question in, in modern American society, because um, 
the whole dialogue, the whole public discourse has become so contentious. Yeah. Um, and people are afraid of stepping on landmines. People are afraid that they will encounter um, personal attacks or insults. Gee, I wonder where they got that idea. Um, <laughs> and, you know, all I can say is, um, well, there's one solution to that problem, which is don't associate with people you disagree with, but that's <laughs> not really right. Um, so it's, it's a, a developing a way of offering facts first and conclusions as a result of a process. So, you know, very often people will just throw conclusions at each other. And if you start to offer a, a trail or a chain of facts, um, which you want to be sure of, so you've done your work, um, and then lead them as a horse to water to a conclusion which you think is sensible, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a, a plan of action. I don't know how often that'll work, but I think that's in this, in this context, in this information society that we've got now, I think that's the only way to really deal with it is to like grab hold of as many facts as you can find and build the case. You become a lawyer for your own point of view and you want to amass the information that will support it as you make your argument. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, I think also, it, I think uh, we aren't quite as apart as we maybe are sometimes led to believe there's sort of the loud people that always want to be angry or want to be um, whatever. And I think most people aren't quite that, that crazy. Oh, no, the, the, the public, this, the public discourse is, is now a character mm. as a, a ugly caricature of the way people actually talk and think. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. totally totally yeah and i think i think and also i think matters if you guys come with genuineness and uh you know uh i think i think that doesn't always work out that i'm not i'm not sort of pollyannish about that but i think it, it it oftentimes um uh works better than coming at someone with anger or coming at someone with outrage uh you know i understand at times you that, that, that that's needed but but oftentimes, if you come with some grace, I think people tend to, um, they might not agree with you, but they don't necessarily think you're the most evil thing. Um, well, you, 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 you know, I think it's easy to feel insulted or disrespected when somebody comes at you angrily or accusive, accusing. Totally. And so you don't want that reaction. You want to either have convinced them or at best, have them t tolerate your point of view and still like you as a person. So, you know, accusation and anger are the wrong, wrong tools to use. Totally, totally. Yeah, Dace. So uh, one mini question I have is that I feel like your experiences navigating Hollywood have, have trained you into the, the thick skin <laughs> resilience business when it comes to navigating difficult people, um, but I uh, which you might want to comment on. But I also, uh, I would love for you to share what you've done. I mean, so Sean's, you know, we started at CSUCI, right as uh, Katrina, you know, was uh, hitting, making groundfall and Gabriel was two and a half years old. Now he's almost 22 and mm. studying brain science himself. Um, the, uh, so we, and what Sean always crafted with the trip, that it wasn't just about, you know, the, the this geographic location, but it's the culture and the music and the food and all of that. And you've been really instrumental in um, really doing everything you can to sustain, which, you know, Katrina hit. And then we have, you know, COVID just did another number on music in New Orleans. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience in trying to preserve the music and culture of New Orleans through all these, you know, the waves keep kind of slamming down just as we, you know, the city starts to get its footing maybe again, even in a different way. You know, I, I was um, invited to uh, a, uh, an evening at a bookstore, and the uh, author was a woman from the University of Mississippi who had collected blog posts from New Orleans after the first year. 
following the storm, following the flood. And she wanted me to read something that I had written. And I read it and I said, you have to have the wrong date on this. This is not 2007. This must be 2006. She said, no, we've absolutely confirmed. And the reason I said that was because 2007, we were still worried whether the city would survive at all. It was, it had such, I forgot how long it took for the belief to take hold that we're gonna s surmount this. So uh, you talk about resilience. I mean, uh, the idea that, and, and it's important to note that the vast majority of the reconstruction of New Orleans, which has taken place over the last two decades, has been by individuals rebuilding their homes, reopening their businesses. The story that has really not been told is of what had to happen for restaurants to reopen. They had to open these giant freezers where meat had been sitting for 10 days at 100 degree temperatures had been getting as rotten and as rank as humanly possible, uh, seeping into the grout between the bricks. I mean, it's just, it's amazing what people went through. And the idea that people can love a place enough to be able to want to work that hard to help rebuild it is a lesson, I think, about the value of culture, tradition, uh, community, uh, the, the fact that, I mean, in New Orleans, you know, people will talk to strangers. It's all one community. Um, and that became such a strong point in recovery that we were, we talked to each other, we know each other. Um, Going back to your intro, uh, I have no resiliency when it comes to the assholes in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing strong enough to withstand that. Uh, just, you know, a friend of mine, I was working with an engineer today, a producer, who was just saying, you know, after a day with these people, I just want to go home and sleep for like five days. That's the cure. Uh, but, you know, talking on a community wide level, um, it's knowing the people you're with, being able to disagree with them and still know we're in this together. Um, these were tools that were hugely important in motivating people to come back, to do the really hard backbreaking work of digging out and, uh, rebuilding and, uh, there was almost no institutional help in doing that. Uh, this was a grassroots recovery, 95%. Uh, there was a little help, but um, it was really, and, and that story has yet to be told uh, in all its drama and, and hope. Absolutely. Thank you. Great question. Well, that's, that's a wonderful uh, uh, way to uh, maybe wrap up our, our session with Harry. That was fantastic. Um, thanks, everybody. If you wouldn't mind unmuting and just give a little clap for our friend, our, our, the guy that's taking – we're keeping him from dinner and all that stuff, and he's still here. So that's awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, my friend. That was great. Always a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, Thank you so much. Hopefully see you in a few months in New Orleans, and be well, and, uh, and have fun. Thank you. Yes, Please tell Judith, thank, you, thank you for being our uh, always amazing. Yeah, audio mom. visual. Yes, excellent <laughs> audio visual aid. <laughs> yeah. Thank y'all. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Bye.